Hi, this is Jen Rubin, and this is Jen Rubin's Green Room. Fresh off the presses, we have the D.C. Circuit's decision on immunity. If you recall, Judge Chutkin in the D.C. case concerning January 6th ruled that there is not absolute immunity for Donald Trump, that he can be prosecuted for crimes committed during his presidency. Trump took that up on appeal, and about four weeks ago or so, there was an oral argument. And since then, there's been much toing and froing and complaining and whining that the court was taking too long. Well, it was worth the wait. It was a unanimous opinion called a per curiam, meaning for the court as a whole, that suggests that all the judges had some kind of hand in writing it. And it was unequivocal, it was scholarly, and I think it's bulletproof. Essentially, the court says it would be absurd, it would collapse our entire legal structure for Trump to be able to claim that a president is immune forever for whatever he does in office. And the court, in a 57-page opinion, I think was quite accurate, quite specific in what Trump was claiming and why that was absurd. Now, a good deal of the case was taken up, or a good deal of the opinion was taken up on whether the court should even be hearing the case on collateral appeal, that is, on interlocutory appeal before a judgment. And there's a very long legal discussion of that. If you're interested, go ahead, read that. But what you should really focus on is pages 39 to 41, and those are the heart of the matter. Where the court defends the rule of law, the court makes clear that it would be even more absurd to allow Trump to interfere with the transfer of power and then claim legal immunity from that. So what happens now? The court actually put Trump on a very short timeline. He has until Monday to seek a stay from the Supreme Court in order to prevent the trial from going forward. If he doesn't get the stay or the Supreme Court um, denies cert altogether, we're back on the trial schedule. And although we've lost uh, a few weeks um, on this uh, issue of immunity, Trump will be back on schedule for a trial sometime in the late spring or early summer. What happens if the court does take up the appeal? Well, it could hear it on an expedited basis, the same way that it is hearing now uh, this week, actually, the decision on whether Trump is disqualified under Section 3 of the 14th Amendment. If that happens, then we have a later start. But I am quite confident that either way, there will be time to get in a final verdict before the election. It may be close if the Supreme Court takes up its time, but I think we're going to get there. And that is important because a great percentage of the Republican Party, forget about independents and Democrats, say, at least they say now, that they will not vote for Trump if he is a convicted felon. And we're going to get two tries at that. Alvin Bragg will be bringing his case to trial in March. That's the falsification of business records under New York law. And then we will have the December 6th trial. So this is good news for the rule of law. It's good news for democracy. And stay tuned to figure out what the Supreme Court is going to do next. As listeners to this program know, one of my chief concerns is the survival of democracy, which used to be a given and no longer is. And so it's very appropriate to bring to the program someone who works on democracy 24-7. Ural Epstein is the CEO of a group called RDI, Renewal, the Renewal of Democracy Initiative. And this group tries to preserve democracy at home and internationally. They work with dissidents, they work with thought leaders, and uh, together with um, his partner in crime, Gary Kasparov, um, who is a great chess champion and is an even greater proponent of human rights, Uriel works to maintain the pillars of democracy around the world and here at home. So I'm thrilled to have him on the show. Uriel, welcome to the program. Thanks for having me, Jen. 
It is such a pleasure to have you here as we are fighting tooth and nail to keep democracy <laughs> operating. Oh, yeah. Um, tell us how RDI got started um, and what it originally did and what it's kind of evolved to doing now. Yeah, so, you know, it's 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 kind of a, this interesting story with a little bit of a serendipitous journey, which I feel is kind of true for much of my life. Um so RDI was founded originally in 2017. Uh, it was founded by Gary Kasparov. So for those that don't know, he's considered one of the best chess players in history. And it just so happens that he's also one of Vladimir Putin's uh, greatest opponents. And so he's been living, living in exile here in the U.S. Um, since 2012. And so after uh, President Trump was elected in 2016, uh, you kind of had this small group of folks uh, whom initially kind of Gary semi-jokingly referred to as refugees from the Wall Street Journal. Uh, and so, you know, I mean, you know all these folks, right? So so uh, it was Gary, Brett Stevens, Max Boot, you know, a few others who all sort of came together and were just horrified at, you know, what was going on in the U.S. And here Gary went from essentially uh, trying to uh, ring the alarm bells about the, the dangers of Putin and Russia and Russian dictatorship and so forth to suddenly doing the same thing here in the U.S., um, and ring the alarm bells about how Trump's rhetoric was very reminiscent of Soviet dictators and and others where, you know, it's I think it's really interesting. I quite frankly don't think that Trump is well-educated enough to actually know what he's doing and know the language he's using, but almost inadvertently he falls into the same patterns of speech, the same patterns of thought as these other dictators from both left and right because, you know, um, authoritarianism doesn't have a political bent. It's, it's authoritarianism is authoritarianism is authoritarian and its only goal is power. Uh, it doesn't have to be right-wing or left-wing power. And so in this case, Trump actually, uh, you know, his language was very similar to these, what we would consider a communist left-wing uh, dictators of the Soviet Union. And so, um, you know, Gary, Gary launched RDI. He brought in folks from the center left and the center right. And then he and I met in late 2018, um, again, very serendipitously, because when I was still in college, I'd founded an organization dealing with Israeli-Palestinian issues, as well as civil military affairs. And that org, you know, kind of over the course of the last decade became a bigger deal than I thought it would. I mean, it was honestly just a passion project. Nobody ever, you know, we were all volunteers. Um, but it became this big thing between Yale University and West Point. Um, and one of our supporters happened to sit on the board of the, at that point, still nascent and somewhat inchoate uh, RDI. And so he introduced me to Gary. And, you know, I, I kind of joke, like, Gary, you know, I come from an Eastern European family. My parents are from the former USSR. And, you know, Gary's name had some weight. Uh, there's kind of a, I, I, you know, and I joke about this that, you know, in, the, in, in English, you would say if someone's not that smart or whatever, you'd say, oh, well, you know, he's no Einstein. Uh, in Russian, you could literally say he's no Kasparov. That is a literal expression you could use in Russian. Um, so anyway, um, so, you know, Gary and I meet and, you know, we have a few conversations and ultimately decide to start working together. And so I kind of become the first employee and start building out this organization. And, you know, as you kind of implied, RDI has gone through a couple of different iterations and a couple of different hypotheses. Um, are we kind of, I would say we've gone through three distinct hypotheses. Uh, the first hypothesis was that the way we can drive impact is through civic education and that we were going to become a civic education organization. We were going to get content into schools uh, and build ourselves out that way. And that didn't really pan out because our that hypothesis was sort of dependent upon um distribution being different from the way it actually is. So I originally had believed that essentially you could get content into schools through, you know, at the level, uh, maybe at the state level or at the very least at the district level. As it turns out, it's basically at the level of each individual classroom, like not even at the school level, but like at the teacher level, which, you know, for an organization that's literally one employee at that point, you know, and we could bring on a couple contractors or whatever, like that was just simply not going to be the where, where we grew, especially because quite frankly, our board of directors was not made up of teachers or administrators, but rather, you know, political uh, uh, speakers and thought leaders and so forth. So um, hypothesis number two was that, okay, well, if we're not going to create content specifically for schools, uh, 
then what we'll do is we will highlight these sort of prominent individuals from center left and center right who can in bring their respective bases together around kind of core shared principles. That was that was the idea where, you know, you'd have someone on the right, someone on the left, and, you know, they'd bring in their core bases together, uh, you know, based on kind of some shared understanding of, of liberal democracy. And, um, you know, that hypothesis, quite frankly, also did not work out, um, albeit for a very, very different reason, which is that, at you know, this is right before COVID. And what we found was that people's tribal identity, and, you know, what I mean by tribal identity is that their affiliation with their sort of self-identified political views was so strong that as soon as somebody who was formerly a member or even a leader of their, uh, you know, political party spoke out against some of those views, they were no longer a member of the tribe and therefore they were no longer someone who could be trusted or who should be listened to. And, you know, I saw this happen with multiple folks uh, from both the center left and the center right who, you know, were, were sort of dismissed by elements of their base. And this finally brought us to hypothesis number three. And hypothesis number three, uh, and, you know, where RDI is today, it, you know, was based around two simultaneous kind of realizations. The first was that Gary happened to receive two awards from two very, very different organizations within the span of just a few months. One was a left-wing award. Uh, or rather an award from an organization generally considered to be left-wing. And the other award was named the Barry Goldwater Award. <laughs> so I'll let you guess at the, as to its politics. And, you know, that got me thinking, how is it that someone like Gary could receive these two awards from two completely disparate political movements within the span of a few months for the same exact work when kind of the respective leaders or former leaders, I suppose, of those kind of political groups were no longer welcome? And this was at the same time as I started thinking about my own upbringing. My parents were immigrants from the former Soviet Union. Uh, I grew up hearing stories of how the U.S. was this incredible city on a hill. And how, you know, as Bill Clinton would say, there's nothing wrong with America that cannot be fixed by what is right with America. And it gave me, uh, you know, what I think is a very different perspective on the U.S. for many of my peers, right? I mean, I'm, I'm in my early 30s, uh, and quite frankly, a lot of my classmates in college and, and elsewhere have, a, I think, a much more pessimistic view of the U.S. because they don't know anything else, right? They don't see, they don't know what the alternatives are to the American system are, and therefore all they know is the problems that exist with the American system. And I think that in turn leads to a much more pessimistic view of America's potential uh, as a force for good in the world than those who, you know, grew up elsewhere and, and know what authoritarianism is truly like and so forth. And so what all of this brought us to is a realization that dissidents you know, people who have risked their lives for some semblance of freedom, uh, you know, in their home countries are going to be uniquely positioned to convey, you know, what amounts to a very positive message about how inspirational American democracy can truly be while simultaneously highlighting the threats to that democracy. And so that's where, where RDI is today, is that we, uh, you know, on the one hand, we seek to unmask and confront the international alliance of dictators. But in so doing, we hope to inspire people in the U.S. and in other free countries uh, to value and defend their own democracies. And that brings us to the $64,000 question. What happens if American democracy goes away? What happens if we Oof. fall into an authoritarian um, downfall? Um, mm. What happens to the rest of the world? Well, I think this is, uh, this, this is kind of a two-part question. Um, you know, I think the first part is is the hypo hypothetical, and then the second part is like, what do we think will happen after twenty four? And uh, you know, on the one hand, I, I'm going to have, I think, you know, unsurprisingly very depressing things to say, but I also think I hope I, I will have some inspirational things on this note as well. Kind of both of these looking abroad. So to answer the first question of like, what happens if America becomes truly authoritarian? 
it's going to be bad. I mean, there's no question about it. And it's, of course, the downstream effects, it's not just for the American people, but we're talking if the U.S., this shining city on a hill, the country that, quite frankly, dissidents and other freedom fighters around the world look to every single day as their exemplar. If we fail, if we fall, then God only knows what will happen to global democracy. And, well, actually, I'll be, I'll be more pessimistic. I, you know, I think we do know what will happen to global democracy, and that's that we're about, we're, we will enter a a trend of uh, democratic deterioration around the world that will make the last 15 years look like a walk in the park. Because what you're going to start seeing is you're going to start seeing authoritarians resurgent in countries around the world. And those leaders in kind of democratic nations who, you know, still subscribe to these classical liberal principles that, you know, traditionally both the right and the left believed in, they're going to find themselves under pressure and they're going to find themselves having to kowtow, quite frankly, uh, you know, to American leaders potentially and other leaders who may not believe in those values. So that's the really depressing thing. But the more uplifting thing is that it's never game over. You know, and and the example I use here is Poland. For eight years, Poland was ruled by a, you know, what amounted to a kind of wannabe authoritarian leader in government. Right. And, and, you know, you see this uh, in, in, in a way with, you know, they, they, they had significant influence. They changed the media organizations. They, um, you know, kind of created a system that led to an election just a couple months ago that was not, fr- not fair, but was ultimately free. And after eight years of rule, they were defeated at the ballot box. And you now have a government in Poland which is committed once again, to the principles that I think, you know, most of us subscribe to and which are tr- which is trying to undo the damage of this regime. And so I should say that even if, you know, someone like Trump does become president uh, in, in 24, this is not the moment for us to say, all right, you know, I'm moving out of America. I'm giving up. This is it. It's over. America's been lost you know, uh, it's time to go home and, and, and hide away somewhere. You know, this is when we begin to fight. Unfortunately, it will be akin to being in Vichy, France, um, will be underground because I think Trump um, will be retaliatory. He'll be uh, punishing. He will single out his opponents. ever so slightly. Um, I think we by now know the telltale signs of authoritarianism because Trump keeps advertising them. He wants to use the military. He wants to put certain media operations out of office. He wants to use the justice system to get back at his enemies. He wants to vilify and deport immigrants. These are all certainly telltales of an authoritarian system. And his comment about purity of blood is straight from the Hitlerian playbook. The question I have is, what did Poland do to recover their democracy that we can learn from? So I think the first step is to sort of try our best to avoid apocalyptic thinking, right? It's, it's, you know, so yes, if this were to happen, needless to say, I think that the damage wrought uh, due to, you know, kind of Trumpism um, would be vast. It would be tremendous and, quite frankly, even more dangerous than than he was earlier because he, you know, he now ha- will have people around him who, one, buy into his approach and, two, who know what they're doing, right? They're going to be much more capable than, you know, the people who surrounded him kind of in 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 2016 were. Um, and he's pro- presumably not going to bring on board the kind of Secretary Mattises uh, of the country who would sort of limit uh, or constrain some of his worst instincts. Um, so, you know, on the one hand, yes, very, very dangerous. On the other hand, and, and the reason I say kind of avoid apocalyptic thinking is, you know, I do think things are going to be a challenge. But I also don't think that we're going to suddenly start seeing brown shirts on the street, right? Like we're, you know, I don't think, Jen, that you or I are going to have our our doors getting knocked on by government agents uh, trying to put us away. And while I think the environment will become certainly more challenging, I, I just, 
I think that the American system is still sufficiently resilient that it's not going to become like immediately reminiscent of where Hungary is today or Turkey. Let me push back just a little bit there. I wouldn't imagine people at my doorstep, but I could imagine being audited by the IRS. I could imagine people bringing bogus lawsuits based upon what I write. If they're really bent on kind of a totalitarian, retaliatory system, there's a lot of danger they could do to people who publicly disagree with them. I mean, yeah, I think that's a possibility. I, I, and, I, and I don't discount it. I mean, I think Trump's rhetoric has indicated that he does have a fundamentally vengeful mindset, and it certainly would not, he would not see it as being beneath him to try to leverage some of those tactics to go after those with whom he disagrees or those who have criticized him as an individual or his record. You know, I, I still think there would be pushback from within the system. Like, I do think the judiciary would not simply allow itself to be used as a mechanism to go after his opponents. And, you know, and we've seen Trump appointed judges, uh, you know, smack down uh, a lot of his arguments. I mean, we saw that in the wake of the 2020 election where I forgot what the number was. I think it was over 60 court cases that he lost. And, you know, presumably a significant percentage of them were by uh, his own appointed judges. So, like, I, I do think people still... You know, the American system is an advanced system. It's one that there, where there's a tradition. So I do think there would be pushback. So I don't, I, again, it, it's not impossible. I'm certainly not discounting the possibility. I just think that as likelihoods go, I think it's less likely than 50%. It's like it's, I, I would argue, I think it's well under 50% that like you would find yourself immediately under audit or, you know, you'd find the Washington Post or other places getting sued right away. Or if that were to happen, there might be a few trial balloons. Again, I actually think Trump would find it harder to do than than what he believes. So I, I and, and the reason, by the way, I think it's important to make that argument is because if if we right away, right, without even having started that process without having started the fight, if we right away believe that we're going to be under attack and that we're going to have to like go underground or that we're going to have to, you know, in some way clam up or, or you know, start thinking in the terms of like the Samaizdat uh, publications in Russia and the Soviet Union, which were these kind of underground publications that people would burn after reading uh, because, uh, you know, they were afraid of being found out by the authorities. Like as soon as we go into that mindset, it limits what we can do. It limits our creativity. It limits our our, um, it limits our assertiveness, our aggressiveness. Uh, and so I'd be very hesitant to kind of go down that path, one, because we just don't have the data yet, right? Like we don't know. Um, and and two, because if we start that way before anything begins, we're going to be limiting ourselves. And that brings us to your question of Poland, where, you know, I, I think there the government actually had a lot of time. Uh, you know, to try to implement these policies. And they did, they tried, and they did go after a few folks. And I do not want to minimize the damage they did to those individuals uh, whom they went after. And, you know, our mutual friend, Ann Applebaum, certainly felt it uh, herself and 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 for her husband um, and their friends, right, who were in some ways targeted. But nevertheless, you know, these are folks who who persisted, right? And, and, and thankfully, the majority of them were able to do so, right? They were able to go out onto the streets. They protested. Uh, you know, they they got the poll, they got um, people to the polls. You know, I mean, Anne's son uh, was one of the folks who was leading the youth movement in Poland, which was, I think, critical uh, to their success where they were able to look past, and I think this is one of the key lessons we need to take from this in some ways, is they, the, the opposition in Poland and all the different folks over there who may have had different policy prescriptions, different policy preferences, different um, diagnoses of you know what was the most problematic components of the ruling party, they came together or, you know, despite their disagreements and they didn't continue their infighting, and they were able to put forth a compelling platform that was a unity platform that was able to bring out enough people to the polls where despite a somewhat uneven and unfair playing field, they were able to win. And that's one of the things that I'm very troubled by in the U.S., which is that I all too often see people kind of standing on technicalities or standing on disagreements over relatively minor things when, you know, they're missing the forest for the trees, right? Right? Like here we, there is a threat of authoritarianism and folks kind of, um, you know, they, they are willing to look past it every so often. I think this is the 
absolute key. Whenever you look at a society that is fighting back or has fought back, it's the ability, I think, to manage a very broad coalition. You need all the friends you can get. And we saw this in Israel with the democracy movement. Exactly. They had people from right, left, center, secular, religious. They were all able to agree that democracy, and in that case, an independent judiciary, was crucial to the national ethos. And I think it does us no good when someone like Liz Cheney stands up and then people from the left say, well, she was wrong on Ukraine uh, or she was wrong on uh, uh, Iraq or she was wrong on abortion. I can't agree with anything she has to say. She's the most powerful voice on the right when it comes to democracy. Of course, she's our friend for these purposes. So I think um, making um, strange bedfellows (laughs) or simply embracing people who believe in your core value has to be front and center, doesn't it? If I, you know, if I had to name one ethos, if I had one phrase to describe the ethos of RDI, it would be strange bedfellows. That is what RDI is all about. It's bringing people together whom you would never anticipate being in the same room. Uh, And whether that means people from the left or the right, or whether that means, you know, a Venezuelan dissident calling for support of Ukraine, right? Or a Zimbabwean dissident calling for the recognition that Hamas is a terrorist organization akin to ISIS and that we shouldn't be defending it, right? I mean, it's, it's having these broad coalitions across geographies, politics, differences, and so forth that are critical. And I will make one note here because, you know, I have also noticed something with on the left where it's not only where, you know, I see some folks on the left kind of attacking Liz Cheney and attacking uh, others and, you know, obviously attacking you sometimes and 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 Bill Crystal and, and others who are certainly all very much on the same page. Uh, but, you know, obviously there are other policy differences and, and, and so forth. But the other thing that I found to be, you know, pretty pro- pretty challenging challenging is on the culture side, right? I mean, this is something that the right has taken significant advantage of. But to be frank, the left has fallen into the same trap. I mean, they have pursued these sort of cultural policies that are popular on social media, but are unbelievably unpopular uh, nationally. And, you know, we saw this during COVID with San- in San Francisco, right? Very famously, you know, they were talking about renaming high schools and investing millions of dollars in renaming high schools that there wasn't a single student attending at that point uh, due to COVID policies. And, you know, that was hugely unpopular. Or you had, you know, a prosecutor or a district attorney, rather, who had formerly worked for uh, Hugo Chavez in Venezuela. And that was an actual thing. I mean, all of this sort of lends itself to this right wing messaging to the point where I kind of make the argument that the best friend of the far right is actually the far left. You know, there it's a vicious circle and they're just kind of feeding one another and quite frankly, trapping the vast majority of Americans in this place where we have nowhere to turn. And we certainly saw that with the defund the police. That was not the position of Joe Biden. That was not the position of 95 percent of Congress on the Democratic side. But you had a few people in Congress and a few people out there. And that phrase just stuck and the right went to town with it. And they ran on it in many races. And it was not even a position that most Democrats agreed with. So I think you're right that you really have to pick your battles. On the other hand, when a social issue comes along that proves to be quite popular, then I think you have to lean in. And to my delight, my surprise, the pro-choice movement has turned out to be a somewhat unifying uh, movement. You see 60, 65 percent of people agreeing. So I think people have to be a little bit smart here um, and figure out what are the 65 percent issues and what are the 15 percent issues and choose more of the former rather than the latter. Exactly. I want to transition a little bit because of your background and also your exposure to Gary to talk about Ukraine. Correct me if I'm wrong, but I think you have one parent from Ukraine and one parent from Russia. Good memory. Yeah. My my mom was born and raised in Kiev. Uh, my father born and raised in Moscow. And did they meet there or they met here in the United States? Actually, they met in Israel. Um, there you so go. <laughs> my dad was an anti-communist, a, a Zionist, an activist. He uh, was called in by the KGB at one point, and and this was the early 70s. So we're talking 72, 73. Um, and so at that point, you have basically a 50% chance where either 50% you're going to go and, and get put into a gulag or prison and, and you become a refusenik, 
or 50%, you get exiled. Technically, you can't leave, you get exiled. And so thankfully, my father uh, was just annoying enough to be noticed, but not so prominent as to justify being in prison. So they exiled him. Uh, That was in 73. My mother was uh, traded for grain in 79, uh, courtesy of the Jackson-Vanik Amendment, at a time when America, I should note, was kind of a, a very clear moral world leader and people look to the U.S. to lead. And and the jackson Vanek Amendment is a perfect example of, of exactly that leadership. And, you know, an entire generation of Soviet Jews, my, my mother included, uh, owe, owe a huge debt of gratitude to America for that. And for those of uh, our listeners who are too young to recall, uh, that was essentially a deal that will sell grain to the Soviets, which unbelievably could not feed their own people because of their incompetent communist system. And um, one of the things we, quote, got in return was that they would release a whole bunch of Soviet Jews. Those Jews went to Israel and are largely responsible for the startup nation. So they did a great favor in a very backhanded way, um, which shows always be on the the side of democracy. It Create the creative juices, the entrepreneurial spirit all flow from democracy. So good things happen downstream. So as we sit here today, the House Republicans, um, God bless them, have not agreed on an aid package to Ukraine. How bad are things for Ukraine? And what happens if they don't get on their horse and get this done very quickly? Uh, Things are bad. You know, there's there's no two ways about it. I was in Ukraine in May. Um, I I led a delegation of sort of American thought leaders, uh, you know, over there for, you know, for people to see with their own eyes what's going on. Uh, RDI has been a very significant uh, or not, I don't know about how significant, you know, small in, in the global scale of things, but I suppose significant as a small nonprofit where we've provided, you know, a, a bit over $10 million in humanitarian aid to various organizations in Ukraine. Um, and so I spent, uh, we spent about four or five days in Kiev, and then most of the group left. And then I went separately with some of our Ukrainian colleagues to Kharkiv, uh, which is much closer to the front lines in the Northeast. Uh, today, I'm not sure it would necessarily be safe for me to go to those same places where I was back then because that region is under constant shelling by Russia. And uh, the Ukrainians, because of the delay in American aid, are in a position where they're rationing shells. I mean, they may have somewhere between like four and five shells for a 48-hour period. And so Russia's just pummeling them. And meanwhile, they can only shoot a couple of times, uh, you know, in that in that period of time. But you know, I want to take a step back on on Ukraine because this is this has been a, a, a big issue on the U.S. side, I would say, which is that you know we've been trying, we've been looking at this conflict as kind of boiling a frog, where we want to sort of give our aid gradually and we'll have a trickle out. And even when we had the money, right, even when the administration had whatever money it needed, it still chose to have that aid trickle out and it delayed and delayed and delayed and delayed. And so people look at the Ukrainian counteroffensive of this past summer and they're frustrated and disappointed. And, you know, they might even question, like, what's the future for Ukraine? And yet the sort of, uh, I wouldn't say the the failure, but but certainly the, um, the kind of... Uh, inability to advance for that counteroffensive was, I would argue, a direct result of the West's failure to give them aid in a timely fashion. If we had given them the tanks that they need, and I'm not even talking about the planes. I mean, we should have given them planes ages ago, but but even setting the planes aside, if we had given them tanks 10 months sooner, the Russians would not have had the time to mine everything that they mined, and the Ukrainians could have advanced much more quickly, uh, you know, without having to go through territory that was so densely mined, in fact, that according to American military doctrine, for our superior military, it would have been considered impassable. 
And yet the Ukrainians were trying to, to pass it. And so. And why was, were they doing this? This was such a frustration. Ukraine would ask for something, say tanks or say, you know, a plane. And we would say, no, 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 no. And months would pass and things would get worse. And then they go to Germany and Germany said, well, we'll get you a plane or a few planes. And then they come back to the United States and say, OK, fine, we'll give you the planes. What is the purpose of this rigmarole? I mean, you'll have to ask Jake Sullivan. Uh, I, I unfortunately don't know. Uh, you know, I can guess, right? I mean, and, and, but to be, I'll be honest that my guesses aren't going to always be particularly generous, uh, you know, to the logic of the administration, uh, which, you know, I think it's sufficiently marred by self-deterrence, right? This idea that, oh, well, it's this next thing that Russia is going to use as an excuse to launch nukes. I mean, and, and, and I'll go and say, look, the, the, the risk of Russia launching nukes is never zero, but in fact, it goes up the longer this conflict goes on. Not, you know, it's not going to, Russia's not going to suddenly launch nukes because we've given Ukraine more effective weaponry, uh, or, and certainly it hasn't, right? Because if you think back, remember, HIMARS, right, were, were more offensive weapons, and, and it was said, well, we can't give them HIMARS because uh, as soon as we do, that's a red line, Russia's going to Russia's gonna go ballistic. And, you know, what did Russia do? Nothing. Uh, you know, Russia said that expansion of NATO on its borders, that's the front line, or rather, that's the red line. We, we, we will, you know, we'll never allow it. And yet now we see Finland and Sweden, uh, and, you know, with Finland and Sweden kind of in the process to join NATO, Russia says, oh, well, you know, we don't care, right? Like, that was actually essentially what Putin said was, I don't have an opinion on that. They're welcome to do whatever. Uh, and, you know, we'll respond accordingly or, or whatever, but certainly there was no nuclear threat. And then same one for tanks. And now the next step will be planes. And so we keep giving them this stuff that we'd say we're never going to give them, but we do it too late for it to actually push the Russians away. So I think the best case scenario, quite frankly, is that we are self-deterring and it's kind of the psychological challenge uh, almost of like, well, you know, of just kind of being willing to just jump into the deep end right away instead of kind of go wading through the pool, uh, you know, from the shallow end very slowly all the way in. So, you know, that's sort of the best case. The the worst case, which I hope is not true, and, you know, I, I don't know, but but I hope this isn't true, is that, you know, they're looking for a deal. Uh, I think that's a possibility, that they're looking for a deal with the Russians, and therefore they're trying not to sort of empower the Ukrainians to do what they have to do on the battlefield. And we hear this from folks, right? We hear this from people like Samuel Chirap of the Rand Institute and, and others who have, quite frankly, been wrong every single step of the way. They've been wrong for years uh, about everything having to do with Ukraine. And yet we see that they have a kind of, I think, an, there's an open ear to some of those people in the administration. And I do sort of question why that is. Um, so that's something that's very worrying. But, but, but to your core point that right now, you know, to the credit of the Democrats, they are pushing on this. They want the $61 billion for Ukraine. The House Republicans have decided to use this as a wedge issue to take, hold it hostage in return for um, uh, trying to strike something on the border. And while I do believe the Democrats should just agree, I think it would be a smart move for them at this point to agree, uh, you know, there's it doesn't change the fact that you do have kind of one side, even if it's not enough, even if it's too slow and so forth, they're still pushing for that aid. And you have the other side trying to hold that aid hostage. One of the reasons why you don't want them to strike a deal now, ironically, is the same reason we keep saying Israel doesn't want to strike a deal now or perhaps a few weeks ago. And that is you have to beat the other side in order to have a deal that is morally defensible. There are some regimes, some, some enemies for who there is no coexistence or they have to be um, really outside your borders in order for you to coexist. So I think this notion that we can sit down and broker some kind of agreement while Russia still occupies large parts of Ukraine would be seen as a huge victory for Putin. He doesn't care that he expended a few hundred thousand men or billions of dollars. He stuck with it, and by gosh, he's going to reclaim part of the Russian Empire. And the lesson would be, wait a few years and try it again. Get another chunk of territory. So I think one of the reasons why we want to give them more aid is so that Putin doesn't come back again in two years, in three years. That. The answer is no, you can't go in and be in a neighboring country. Um, do you think 
there are people in the administration, and I think there is a division of opinion there, um, who understand this. And most importantly, um, do you think I do that President Biden understands this? You know, obviously trying to divine what people understand or don't understand is like reading tea leaves, and I've never been particularly good at that. Um, I, you know, I, I've heard, I think, similar things to what you've heard, which is that there is a division in the administration. You have folks like secretaries Blinken and Austin uh, on one side of that division understanding the threats uh, posed to Ukraine and pushing for us to do all we can. I know Secretary Blinken, I think, privately said something like a year ago that he would have given them planes if he could, uh, you know, something like that. But um, today, meanwhile, you have, um, you know, National Security Advisor Jake Sullivan um, uh, you know, and, and and a few others on the other side of that divide and Biden kind of finding himself in the middle, kind of listening to all the voices and ultimately making the call. Um, you know, I think Biden does understand this. I think he understands it in his bones. I mean, this is a man who lived through the Cold War, who exactly. was there. He, he, he knows what's at stake. And, you know, I wish he would be more decisive and, and I wish he'd be clear. And, and here's the one thing that the, the the top number one thing that I wish he would do, uh, and I think this would just take the wind out of uh, the sails of of those on the both the far left and the far right who oppose uh, continued American support of Ukraine. I wish he would clearly articulate the end goal. I wish he would clearly articulate the American strategy of what is it that we want out of this. Saying that we're going to be with Ukraine as long as it takes is not a strategy. It literally has no antecedent, right? What is the antecedent to the word it? What is it that we are hoping, uh, you know, will happen? And and we need to be very clear. And, you know, again, I don't think anybody there listens to, to arguments uh, from folks like me. But if, you know, if I could magically try to convey the message, you know, what I would say is, look, we need to um, we need to highlight that the goal here is victory. And what does that victory look like? That victory looks like Russian soldiers out of Ukraine. It looks like Russian soldiers out of Ukraine. It looks like a Ukraine which has sufficient... Um, security guarantees to ensure that this won't happen again in a few years and that this isn't just kind of the uh, interim period, right? Uh, it's not just the break uh, between wars. Uh, and we need to make sure that Russia cannot, do, you know, engage in this type of adventurism again. Those are the goals. And quite frankly, I think those goals are achievable. And they're achievable with what? 5% of the American defense budget? I mean, that is just an unbelievable bargain. If you were to go back just 30 40 years, 40 years, talk to DOD planners during the Cold War and tell them that we could degrade uh, at over 50% the entire Russian military uh, for the, at the cost of 5% of American of, cur- of current levels of American defense spending, keeping in mind that our defense spending used to be much higher um, as a percent of, of GDP. Um, I, you know, I, they wouldn't believe you. You know, right. what, what are you smoking? What do you mean? You know, I think the problem with articulating the end point is you have to go back and say, well, does this include the Crimea? Does it not include? Does this include, you know, when do you, where do you draw the line? And I think there are probably people in the United States who would say, well, you know, we'll draw the line post-2014. And there are other people who say, well, no, we should get them out of what was historically all of Ukraine. Um, Do you have a view on that? Do you think one is possible and probable or? My, (laughs) My formal view is that it's not my decision. And it's not our decision. It's the decision of Ukrainians. You know, there, there's an old joke, um, you know, the, the, where there's, you're at a bar and you see a couple animals hanging out and uh, you have uh, a chicken go up to a pig and he says, hey, Mr. Pig, together, you and I, we can end world hunger. And the pig looks at the chicken, you know, and the chicken had just laid a few eggs and the pig looks at the chicken and he says, you know what? You're right. We could. But here's the deal. We could end world hunger, but for you, Nah, it would just require a donation. For me, <laughs> that's a commitment. There and and I think that's the difference. The Ukrainians are the ones making the commitment. We're the ones making a donation. Therefore, that decision is ultimately up to them. 
Uh, and I think we can craft our view of victory, our, our view of the end goal in a way that gives Ukrainians the autonomy and the right to determine their own future uh, while still being clear of the end state that we want. And the other, the one other note that I would make here, uh, just to kind of, this is a very strategic note that's, it's not normative in nature, but just looking at the kind of the battlefield, I think people look at, you know, they're, they're obviously the very distinct parts of the battlefield. I mean, this is a huge battlefield. Uh, and as you noted, you have Crimea in the south, you have the eastern portion, the Donbass and all that. You have the Northeast, very close to Russia and Belarus. Um, but, you know, people look and they say, oh, well, Russia took Crimea in 2014. It's simply unrealistic, uh, you know, for the Ukrainians to challenge Russia on Crimea. And strategically, it's actually, that's actually not true. In, in some ways, the eastern parts of the country are actually a more challenging militarily than the southern parts. And the reason for that is because Crimea is supported by the Russians uh, with two links, right? They have the Kerch Bridge, which is man-made. It has already been bombed twice. Uh, and you've got the land bridge in the south. If those two links were to be cut off, then the Russians would have no way of actually supplying their people in Crimea. And so you could essentially take Crimea without a single boot on the ground, right? Because it would become an untenable spot for the Russians to defend. And by the way, we are in a perfect position to enable Ukraine to do that. All we have to do, which we still have not done, is give them the longer range version of attackums that are capable of hitting that bridge. And, you know, we've not we've not given them that. And, and I have to be honest that I'm not it's very difficult for me to describe why we haven't. And and that, you know, and one other note that I'll make is that we've also set very, these very strict limits as to how Ukraine can use uh, our some of our missiles, rockets, and anti-air, where they can hit the rockets that Russia's shooting at them. They can shoot them down, but they're not allowed to shoot the landers if those landers find themselves uh, on the other side of the Russian border. And so what the Russians are doing essentially is they launch these missiles and rockets from like 10 kilometers behind their borders, and the Ukrainians uh, have no choice but to simply hit each rocket down rather than targeting the lander, which as any military person will tell you, is a much harder thing to do than it would be if they could just strike at the actual source uh, of that rocket fire. And I guess an analogy might be if in World War II we said, okay, we'll have lend lease, but you can't use any of these to shoot down German planes, <laughs> or you can't use any of these against German submarines. They would have looked at it like, well, what good is it? Why, why are you doing this? You know, our lives, our existence is at issue. You can't put conditions on this, and yet we have. Um, and, and the scariest thing for me, by the way, about this, the, la the last note on this is it, it – Think about it. Like, Putin didn't invade Ukraine uh, out of nowhere, right? Like, people think, like, oh, well, he's crazy or what? No, he's not. Like, he actually had really good reason to do what he's doing. And the re that, that good reason, by the way, is that the Western world, the free world, did not respond to previous Russian provocations, right? And you look at it historically. In 2000, in the early days, right? You're talking about in the very early 2000s, you have the destruction of Grozny, right? And turning Grozny into dust. Then in 2008, you have the invasion of Georgia, which the free world didn't particularly respond to. In 2014, the original invasion of Ukraine in 2015, the bombing of Syria uh, in 2020, uh, the invasion of Belarus uh, or 21, I never remember which, and then either 21 or 22, you had the invasion of Kazakhstan. In both of those instances, when I say invasion, he did that in support of the existing dictator when there were when there's a popular uprising. And in each of those instances, the free world did exactly nothing. And so he, in 2022, decided, oh, well, you know, I'm clear, I have this history of doing crazier and crazier things. Nobody's responded. Why not take Ukraine? And so now with us sort of limiting the Ukrainians and preventing the Ukrainians from actually winning, if, God forbid, this does become, you know, this endless protracted frozen conflict, which it does not have to be, uh, or and or, you know, Putin is actually makes advances, well— that that's this incredibly dangerous incentive that could lead, could actually, in my view, literally lead us into World War III. Because what I could see happening is Putin could look at Lithuania and decide, oh, well, you know, Lithuania is a NATO, sure, but eh, it's a tiny little country. Who cares? You know, NATO, if NATO wasn't willing to defend a 45 million, a 45 million person uh, a country like Ukraine, are they really going to defend a 2 million person country like Lithuania? Probably not. Therefore, I'm going to grab it. And meanwhile, if the U.S. and other NATO countries stay true to Article 5, which, you know, says that an attack on one is an attack on all, then you actually have a direct military confrontation between the United States and Russia. And so that's the thing that actually keeps me at night is that by not giving Ukraine what they need 
to defend themselves. We are going to lead Putin and Russia into a strategic miscalculation where they attack a NATO or a NATO-adjacent country, uh, which in turn leads to this um, uh, direct military conflict. Well, now I have another thing to keep me up at night. And you're all thanks. <laughs> Sorry <laughs> and, about that. Just kidding. Just kidding. Um, let me end the show on um, a, another note back in the United States. Are you optimistic that the forces of democracy in America will hold both in the short term and the long term? <sighs> That's... Uh... Speaking of things that keep you up at night, right? That's that that's what that's what keeps me up at night. Um, you know, the the honest answer is I don't know. The honest answer is it's it's up to us, right? It's up to it's up to 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 us here. You know, kind of talking about this. It's up to the our, you know your listeners. It's up to each and every one of us to ensure that the forces of democracy do hold, right? And that and that I you know it's important to note that the for that. Being active in a democracy isn't something you just do on election day, right? It's not, you know, you vote and you're done. You know, this is a responsibility that uh, you have to take seriously all the time. And, you know, earlier in this conversation, you pointed out the pro-democracy movement in Israel. You know, and I think that's actually something that we should really be inspired by because you had elections, you had free and fair elections in which, you know, a wannabe authoritarian, uh, Bibi Netanyahu, won um, and, you know, he said during the election that he was going to be trying to do this incredibly undemocratic, uh, what he, he called the judicial reforms, which is truly euphemistic uh, for what would have essentially amounted to the borderline dismantling of the Israeli judiciary, which is, you know, kind of the core, the key check and balance on, on the Israeli government. Um, and the Israeli people didn't say, oh, well, we voted and, you know, that's it. We're done here. Instead, what they did is they did these massive protests every single week, every single Saturday night on the streets, tens, sometimes hundreds of thousands of people in a country, incidentally, of under 10 million people. Um, and and they blocked them. I mean, that protest movement is one of the single most um, incredible examples of civic participation that prevented uh, a, a huge deterioration in Israeli democracy. And I think that the American people uh, should take note of that. They should uh, learn from it. And, and I think we should be ready and willing to do something similar here if and when we po believe that the core tenets and that the fundamental system of American democracy might be at risk. But the one difference, I would say, I would suggest, is that we not wait for the election to do that, that we start doing that before the election and that we ensure that, you know, those who have, you know, who have openly said that they want to overturn the American democratic system never get the opportunity to do so. I think that is fine advice. Um, Uriel, thank you so much. Uh, I hope to have you back, hopefully, um, when both Ukraine and United States uh, democracies are in uh, better shape, um, or at least not worse. Um, so thank you for coming on the program, and thank you for all the work that RTI is doing. Well, thank you, and, and your words to God's ears. And that was Uriel Epstein. It was so much fun chatting with him. And you may be a little bit depressed thinking about the fate of democracy. Sometimes I get depressed too. But somehow we do have the ability to muddle through. And just when you have lost faith in America and you think, how can tens of millions of people be voting for someone who is so obviously a fascist? Remember, all the people who voted for Joe Biden. Joe Biden wasn't the perfect candidate, but he got more votes than any other presidential candidate in history. And that's because there is something deep down in the American spirit, deep down in our sense of right and wrong, that bullies shouldn't win, that the people do control their own government, that freedom means something. Those are no longer, I think, just phrases that we throw around, empty slogans, those have real meaning because they're really in danger. And so I think we have to do the things that people in a democratic society must do when they're threatened, and that is work together, regardless of people who you may not have agreed with in the past. If they're allies for democracy, join hands with them. You've got to get out and vote. You've got to get your friends out to vote. You've got to if you're able, give money to candidates who need it, causes that need it. And you also have to use whatever spoke, spokes, you know, box you have, whatever soapbox you have. It's 
each of us, um, when dialogue with our neighbors, our friends, our colleagues, um, it's with those conversations where you may be able to gently push someone along to vote who wouldn't otherwise vote or chide them about even considering voting for Donald Trump. Because person to person, rather than ads over the TV, are generally a better way of persuading people who are still persuadable. So thank you for joining us today. If you enjoyed the program and you enjoy other programs, tell your friends. They can listen to Jen Rubin's Green Room on Spotify, YouTube, or Apple Podcasts. Bye-bye. 